All right. Hey, Gerald, I think we're live. Hello, Great. everybody. Um, welcome to Politics and Prose Live. I'm Beth Wong. I work in events at PMP. Um, and we thank you so much for joining us in this new format. Um, we are continuing our proud tradition of Politics and Prose author events. Um, and uh, we're getting there uh, with being comfortable with the new technical aspects of it, but we really appreciate your patience as we as we work through it. Um, a couple of items uh, before we begin for uh, those of you who are just joining us for the first time. At any time during the event tonight, you can click on the green button at the bottom of your screen um, to purchase tonight's book on Politics and Prose's website. We are currently offering free media mail shipping on all orders, and your online purchase goes to support our small business uh, that needs its loyal customers now more than ever. Um, just like at all our in-person events, you're able to ask the author a question tonight by clicking on Ask a Question, um, also at the bottom of your screen. Um, you'll submit your question there, and you can read others' questions there, as well as vote for the ones you'd like to hear heard the most with the hear read the most with the up and down arrows. Um, a reminder that unlike our in-person events, the author, um, myself, the host, and the other audience members cannot see you through the screen. We know it's very special because you can't really attend our in-store events in your PJs. Um, we really want to thank you for the bottom of our, from the bottom of our hearts for um, tuning in tonight. Um, these really strange times are devastating to your local businesses, PMP included. Um, your book purchases are what is keeping us in business right now um, and allowing us to continue bringing authors and their new books to our community. Um, on to tonight's event. Um, sorry. In his newest project, Pharma, award-winning journalist and New York Times best-selling author Gerald Posner traces the key players in the trillion-dollar-a-year pharmaceutical industry and uncovers how those once entrusted with improving life have often betrayed that ideal with deadly consequences. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to bring Gerald to your screens. Thank you very much, uh, Beth. And uh, thank you for those of you who have um, come and joined us tonight in this unusual format. Look, this is the first book I published was back in 1986 on Joseph Mengele, the Nazi doctor. This is 13 books later. My wife, Tricia Posner, has done two books on her own. And we've, we're used to going to bookstores, especially indie bookstores, which are the sort of our lifeline for us. And then meeting the people who have interest in the subject or those of you who are readers, uh, we get to mingle afterwards, sign books and talk to you sometimes with extra questions. So this is an unusual new world because of the pandemic that we're forced into. It's great that we're able to do it at all because there was a time uh, when I didn't think this would happen when the, it was first declared by the government. And I must say that for me, I've never had the opportunity of being at Books and Books for a talk. Uh, been in a lot of places for author presentations over the years, but it's our favorite indie store when we happen to be in the capital. Uh, Trish and I go there often when we're in doing research at the archives or wherever else. So when I saw it on the schedule early on, uh, we were both excited that we would actually be there. We're here almost in some ways. Uh, so thank you for coming tonight. You know, when um, I have a, a chapter at the, at the end of um, the, my book, it's a penultimate chapter actually, and it's called uh, The Coming Pandemic. I quote a, a doctor, an infectious disease doctor that uh, Trisha and I interviewed. We do our research together. We interviewed her back in 2016. And she ends this chapter by saying the next pandemic is not a question of if, it's a question of when. But never, we talked about this, both of us, when the book was being put together. Never did we expect we'd be talking about a pandemic now. Never did we think we'd be publishing into a pandemic. It was a theoretical discussion that I understood very well, and I'll discuss with you later, could very well happen, but we didn't think it was happening today. And I must say that in that light of that, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times, some of you may have seen a few weeks ago, it's, it's online, about how pharmaceutical companies, who I've studied for the past five years now, since I did a book on money in the Vatican, uh, the pharmaceutical companies might be a speed bump on the road to vaccine development. Uh, and th that was before I published. Published on March 10th, uh, Avid Reader Press did, my publisher. And then on March 11th, the World uh, Health Organization declared the coronavirus a pandemic. Since then, some of you may have seen me either uh, you know, in The Intercept quoted or at the BBC or on CNN talking about coronavirus, COVID-19, 
pharmaceutical companies in the profit equation. But only one chapter out of 52 in that entire book of pharma is about pandemics. So it seems to many people that there's one misconception of the book. I think it is, they say, oh, that's the book that's talking about coronavirus. And the interesting part is coronavirus and COVID-19, they aren't mentioned in the book. The book was actually at the printer in January when China reported the first two deaths coming out of the country based upon a mysterious new illness. So although I understand the history of pandemics very well, the history of vaccines and the pharmaceutical company, um, it's not this particular virus I was talking about. Since it has broken, and since I've published, I've stayed in, in touch almost daily with some of the infectious disease doctors I've come to know over time to try to find out the inside feeling for how this is going against this disease. And we can talk about that at the end. What I thought I would be talking about with you tonight, I'm gonna to give you a very brief overview of before returning to, to COVID, is the other 51 chapters. Um, this is really a history of the pharmaceutical industry. There were times, although the subtitle now says greed lies, uh, you know, the poisoning of America, there were actually times when pandemic was in the subtitle. The Pills, Profits and Pandemics was a, a draft subtitle that existed almost until the final moment when we ended up going with this one with the publisher. But I thought I'd be giving you a book, and it is a book that starts with patent drugs back in the 19th century. Drugs where it really was the wild west of the pharmaceutical industry, as much as whatever you could call the pharmaceutical industry. They didn't understand what caused diseases. They didn't understand infections. They didn't know a bacteria from a virus for the most part. Um, and in the, in the light of that, you had purveyors of all types of medicines that were based on morphine, cocaine, uh, cannabis, all of it legal. Bayer, uh, the German conglomerate, uh, had a research team that invented aspirin. They found it in the lab. It's one of the great inventions of all time. Two years later, the same exact scientific research team was the one that came up with a, a compound that they named after the German word for heroic, Herosh, heroin. That was legal in the United States as of 1900. It was supposed to soothe the coughs of babies. I suppose it could do that. Um, it was also a cure for morphine addiction. It was used for bronchial infections. So even pharmaceutical companies we know by name, Park Davis, others, Eli Lilly, they started many of them based upon morphine after the Civil War when there was a big demand for it. They grew up on addictive products. They understood the benefit of it and they sold them until 1914 when the Harrison Act was passed that made everything illegal. All of the narcotics were illegal. Then prohibition comes in and alcohol is out because a lot of the tonics that were sold um, also included a high amount of alcohol. And the pharmaceutical industry is a bit lost at that time. To show you how much so, I think it was in 1909, Moody's comes out for the first time with its breaks of American industry, the size of industries. The drug industry is not even listed, which is amazing when you think today how big it is. It was another 20 years before they got listed at like number 13. So it was in the 1920s into the 1930s, 250 to 300 small companies all vying for a piece of this sort of new marketplace. And then something happened in World War II that changed the entire business, and that was penicillin. Excuse me. Um, penicillin revolution, one of the greatest inventions, one of the greatest discoveries of all time, saved hundreds of thousands of lives during the war um, from infections that had killed soldiers on the battlefield. And it was a crash program of importance from the Oxford and British scientists that were bringing it over to America and saying, we have this great drug. It was right behind the atomic bomb in terms of its importance. And the government drafted 10 pharmaceutical companies in and said, we need your help. They said, we will help. And the government then did all the research, all the funding. They got over 32 different patents from the Department of Agriculture. They gave them to them for free. The drug companies had to share their research and the government built the plants, literally 12, 13 plants, these enormous fermentation plants at millions of dollars so that the pharmaceutical companies could then churn out the antibiotic at record amounts. And they did, 650 billion units by the end of the war. And when the pharma emerged from the end of the war, it was in a different position. Those 10 companies that had been involved in the penicillin project 
dominated the business. Now, 80% of the sales went to them. They dominated on profits. They got in the start in terms of their size from the government help. There was no patent on penicillin, so the price on that dropped, but they each were looking for replacement drugs. They were hunting for streptomycin. They were hunting for teramycin and others. And that's where I find Arthur Sackler, the name may sound familiar to you, the Sackler family of Purdue uh, uh, Pharma and the o at the sort of the poster child for the opioid crisis, Arthur Sackler, the oldest of three brothers, three psychiatrist brothers, ends up coming in. He has an advertising agency in, in the 50s, and he lands with Pfizer, and they have a drug called Teramycin Antibiotic, and it's Arthur Sackler who revolutionizes the advertising business and the drug trade. He's the one who comes up with the idea to send detailed men. At that time, they were all men, but salespeople out to the offices, to doctors to sell them. He was the one who came up with the idea of much more aggressive advertising. He was the one who actually proposed for the first time sending out free samples. And what's interesting is at this time, I ended up finding out from the Freedom of Information Act, files on the Sacklers back then, that even in a Senate investigation in 1962, they were investigated for what was called the Sackler Empire. They were looked at for having their hands in all types of companies, including testing companies, drug companies that they had bought a small company already, Purdue, advertising firms. They ended up with a couple of cohorts that they had, um, sort of almost corrupting the, the head of the FDA's antibiotics division. And it was a terrible scandal eventually. At the same time, I received for the first time the files that told me that Arthur Sackler and Raymond Sackler were members of the American Communist Party, card-carrying members, Raymond was, together with his wife, Beverly. They were later directors of Purdue. That meant the FBI was on top of them and secretly had investigations of them through the 1950s and 1960s. Arthur was friends with um, uh, two people that ended up fleeing the United States at, at one point. And it was both, you know, Martha Dowd had become a Soviet spy and her husband, they left the U.S., the FBI was worried the Sacklers could even be in an espionage investigation. And they had leftist credentials, meaning that what they stood up for, Arthur fought in World War II and afterwards the segregation of blood by the Red Cross by black and white blood. Medically, it was insane. There was no reason for it. He was up front. He also provided his advertising firm as a safe haven for journalists who were fired from the New York Times, LA Times, and other places because they had refused in the Red Scare of Joe McCarthy's Senate hearing to testify or answer the question as to whether they had been Communist Party members before and they took the Fifth Amendment. So there are some things that were admirable about the Sacklers, but at the same time, they knew how to sell everything and they did aggressively. So we think of them as Purdue Pharma. I tell you the story of how the Sacklers became the Sacklers. And in telling you that, I think you find a richness. For those of you who watch the, the series Succession on TV about power, dysfunctional family at the peak of power and money, that's the Sacklers playing out against the backdrop of the history of the American pharmaceutical industry. It's Arthur Sackler who takes Hoffman LaRoche's Librium and Valium. He makes Valium the first $100 million drug in the business. He makes it the first billion dollar drug in terms of cumulative sales. He's the one who's telling drug companies in the 60s and into the early 70s when it comes to oral contraceptives and other products, how to market to women. There are chapters in here I have about targeting women, how it was a, a sort of a sexist approach anti-anxiety medications would be sold, for instance, Valium to women. They would be sold to men because the advertising said that essentially they were the ones who had to bring home all the money. They had to work hard. They had to show they were tough and they were out for, uh, sort of as the breadwinner. They were sold to women because women were, quote, hysterical. They were filled with anxiety and they just needed um, to, to work harder. There's actually an Adderall ad from this period that ends up running from the agency in which it shows a, a housewife vacuuming faster. That's what Adderall could do for you. And by the time we get into the 1970s, we start to discover why we have so little faith in pharma today. This is the industry that not only gave us penicillin and gave us a polio vaccine and everything else, and it's done some fantastic things, but also the industry in which Cyril hid the truth for nearly a decade about the increasing cases of blood clots and breast cancer for women who were on the oral contraceptive approved in 1960. This is the same industry where Wyatt hid the information that, about the dangers of hormones with high levels of estrogen when they were marketing them women in, from 1966 and on and telling them that it would make them feminine forever when they knew that they were also developing uh, blood, uh, blood clots and breast cancer. And th there are stories in here that are good stories about scientists inside the lab working on cures and looking for discoveries. And there are also stories you won't be surprised about corporate greed. I have a chapter called Pharmacy Benefit Managers. It's not the name of it, but it's about gaming the system. 
Most of you may never have heard of them, but they're middlemen who are now in the middle of the drug distribution process between the pharma company and between the, the pharmacist that then dispenses the drug to us, the patients. They put themselves in, they create the formularies that are the drug lists that tells you if your insurance covers it or not. And they wield the power. They're multi-billion dollar companies. They're among the top 50, Medco and others in the United States. They're one of the reasons for high drug prices. I have a chapter about uh, orphan drugs, billion dollar orphans, eight of the most, eight of the top 10 most expensive drugs in America today are orphan drugs. Most of you say orphan what? And that's a drug that was designed by a law in 1980 to treat genetic illnesses in which less than 200,000 people were affected. The drug companies have learned to gain that inside and out. As a matter of fact, one even was trying to do it in my view the other day on coronavirus in the pandemic, Gilead, some of you may have seen with remdesivir, one of their drugs, decided they might be able to use that as a treatment for those who have serious bouts of coronavirus, those who may be seriously ill, and they're trying to get it fast-tracked. They put it in the government under a special application under the orphan drug law because there are less than 200,000 people affected in the United States now. As a result, they would get tax credits, special subsidies, extra time on their monopoly, all types of breaks meant for a small market. And if the market for that drug, people seriously ill from coronavirus became more than 200,000, it wouldn't matter. They would still have all the benefits. There were some articles that were run. I was quoted in one in The Intercept. Today, they just announced a few hours ago, they no longer are applying for that special orphan status. So we can keep an eye on drug companies as we're running through this pandemic, which I think we need to do. One last thing on the Sacklers. I do talk a lot about the opioid crisis later. But one of the points when I say they can sell anything, by the time you get to Purdue Pharma and OxyContin, you know what's going to happen. One of the brothers, Arthur, is already dead by then. But what I say, what you know is going to happen because they're able to sell in a way that few people ever have. The best example almost is the Apollo 11 mission, believe it or not. Some of you might remember that uh, Michael Crichton had written his first novel, Andromeda Strain, just a little bit before that, about a mutant virus coming in and killing everybody on Earth. So believe it or not, NASA was worried about whether the astronauts in the spaceship might come back with some virus or some microbe that might prove pathogenic to the, to the globe. Arthur Sackler heard about those worries and thought of a brilliant thing. The drug company Purdue had a small uh, product called Betadine. It was essentially an antibacterial wash sold to hospitals and clinics. He was able to get a meeting with the people at NASA he sold them on the idea of taking Betadine into space. And when the astronauts came down on Apollo 11, they scrubbed the outside, of the, the inside of the door before they opened up and then they scrubbed the capsule down. He had millions of dollars of free publicity. He advertised that all over America to every doctor. They made a fortune on Betadine because they cost them pennies a gallon to make and they were selling it in jars. So if he could get that onto Apollo 11 and make sure that the earth was safe from microbes, he could do just about anything. And in some ways, I guess the idea of a microbe that could uh, be an existential threat to uh, the world brings us back to the current time, which is uh, coronavirus and uh, what's happening with this pandemic. I know from the, the past of the pharmaceutical industry that there are times when they have taken on a vaccine as they did with polio, and it turned out not to have a patent on it. Nobody said, I own it. As a matter of fact, when, when Salk, the inventor of the original uh, polio vaccine, was asked by a reporter, do you think this should be patented? He said, How, could you patent the sun? It's the name of one of the chapters that I have. He thought it should be available for every drug company, for everybody that wanted to use it. And what's interesting about it is that that was sort of the model we thought going forward, that that would always be the case. And what happened afterwards turned a little bit different. So in 1976, for those of you who remember it, some of you who might be in DC will definitely remember. Sorry. Gerald Ford was president in the swine flu scare. Uh, it was the only time since World War II that a, a federal government has ever ordered a mass inoculation program. By the time the inoculations were ready to be given, a few months after the original order came down, it looked as though there was no swine flu. They'd overreacted to it. So only 40 million Americans got inoculated. They wanted to do 100 million. But what's interesting is pharma's response. The four companies, including Merck, uh, their subsidiaries, Sharp and Dome, there was uh, Pfizer in there, there was um, uh, Wyeth, Merck. They had, a bill, had they done the 100 million doses for the vaccine. The government then said, okay, send them to us. We're ready to start distributing them, doing the public inoculations. And they said, oh, 
not right now. They held them back, as remarkable as it may seem. And the reason was they wanted two agreements, which Congress gave into and passed immediately. One was a reasonable profit. Those are the actual words. They made millions on the vaccine afterwards. And the second was they wanted to be absolved of any liability, no matter what happened. The, the government would be responsible. So later, while they walked away with their profits, the US government had 10 attorneys full-time in the Department of Justice who were defending over 4,000 lawsuits as a result of the side effects like Gillian barre these neurological symptoms that came out from the vaccine. That was the standard at which we knew that something had changed. And eventually, we looked at the same situation going forward. So, you know, it has taken a long time to get to the point, most of the pharmaceutical companies have left the vaccine business. They were worried about issues of liability and they didn't think it was that profitable. They've left because they thought, oh, we can make more money on chronic drugs, which is true. If you can get somebody who has diabetes or high blood pressure or cholesterol to take a drug every day for the rest of their lives, it's much better than developing and working on a vaccine, which is given once if it's a good vaccine and that's the end of the illness. Or if you're working on something for an antibiotic, it might go for five or seven days and that's the end of it. So they're looking for these long-term drugs to feed the bottom line. The part that's interesting about this is when I said to you before that I have a chapter called The Coming Pandemic, the infectious disease doctors who spoke to me said that what they were worried about wasn't a virus, which is what we're facing now. They were worried about even something they thought was worse, which is a bacterial pathogen. Uh, you know, there's a difference between them. So if you think of it, uh, polio is, is a virus, but the bubonic plague, um, that was bacterial. Uh, and bacterial pathogens tend to be a bit more virulent, they grow faster, they pass easier, and their, their concern was that the pharmaceutical industry that I wrote about has abandoned antibiotic research at the same time that we've dispensed so many of the same antibiotics for so many years that the public has built up a resistance to them. And I start the book with a chapter called Patient Zero, who's about a woman in Reno, Nevada, who's the first patient in American history who dies in 2016 from a bacterial infection, a super germ that you get in the hospital, so-called MRSA. And every antibiotic known in our arsenal, in pharma's arsenal, failed to cure her. That anter sort of antibiotic resistance becoming wider spread is what's concerned those doctors. But what we have now, we have the different thing. We have a viral pandemic. And a viral pandemic is something that pharma can't prepare for because until you know what the new virus is, you do the DNA search, you're able to strand it out, and then you can start to develop the drugs to fight it in the vaccines. But the question that I have is, we should be able in this country you know, to walk in and chew gum at the same time. And what I mean by that is the most important thing is to get the drugs and to get the vaccine. I understand that. We want to stop the pandemic by getting those developments. And for that, we depend on pharma. But we also want to keep our eye on the ball down the road, that the price for those eventual vaccines is not so expensive that people can't get it easily, or that it takes so much money for governments to buy it that they can't spend it on other medical research. This research is going to be publicly funded by governments from all around the world, billions of dollars. And what breakthroughs are made by these drug companies, I believe, should also be available to all the companies. So the intellectual property should not be held. You know, the, if you wanna know, some people say to me, well, why do you think that pharma might try to do this in an epidemic that's affecting everybody all around the world? And I say, because I'm watching them very closely. And in the $8.3 billion funding bill, the emergency funding that was passed by Congress just recently, it was very interesting, the difference between the first draft and the draft that passed. Two items came out, pharmaceutical lobbyists were there. They took out an item that would have given the government a bigger hammer to come in and try to control prices on the vaccine if it was too expensive at the end. They also took out a clause that would have made their research taken away their intellectual property rights. So if we, the people, patients, the government, don't keep an eye on this down the road, pharma is, that means that we will be left with no leverage at all. And I just wanna make sure that we get the drugs out for COVID-19 as soon as possible. And we are all suffering at this time. Look, everybody's paying a price. People are out of work. They're worried about their finances. Uh, people who are sick in the hospital can't come. Family members can't see them. We have industries like airlines and cruise industries and tourism that are cr cratering. And all I'm saying is you can make a profit if you're a pharmaceutical company. It's a for-profit business. I'm for that. But make it a small one. Don't gouge on this. It's too important for all of us as we go forward. And I hope for those of you who read the book, Pharma, you will find out it's a story that's rich. It's the most significant, difficult book uh, Trish and I have ever tackled. Many times in the middle of it, I thought we would not finish. But I'm glad to say that uh, this project was worth doing.
thank you very much for listening to me. Question, please. <clears throat> Hi. Um, so we've got two questions um, in in the um, kind of in the docket, um, but I also encourage anybody um, listening at home to post their own questions, um, and we'll we'll answer them as they come in. Um, this first one is from Yvette. Uh, can you please comment on the incentive to develop and market drugs that maintain patients with chronic illnesses rather than develop cures? For example, for type 1 diabetes, a m uh, more lucrative to market insulin, insulin pumps, glucose monitors than to develop a cure. Yeah, I, you know, th there's no question that within the treatments, so there are different ways to approach it. And the, and the companies, and I go into this, and I talk about insulin and what biotech has done to it and the products. I think that companies are looking at two things. They're, they're looking for a treatment, you're right. They, if there was a cure, they, they know that if they could cure diabetes, I assure you, there would be a fortune in it for them. They'd be at the top of the Fortune 500 for the next five years. Um, and they would go on to other chronic drugs. That doesn't mean there isn't another chronic drug for them to approach. But th that cure isn't there yet. But what they are concentrating in terms of the treatments, you're right, are are sort of variations, me too drugs sometimes, what I call similar to existing drugs. Other times they break the mold and they're doing something quite different with biotech. Often they're cutting the market for the drug to a smaller size so they can get special funding under this orphan status. And I do think that price becomes very important to them. There's no question about that. I have some cases in the book in which CEOs came into companies with old drugs from the 1950s. They repackaged them and redid them and marketed them for a small group of people. And they said, you know why we aren't making money on this? We only have a patient group that's X this size. We need to raise the price. And they raised the price to a point from literally in one case from $46 on Actar to $26,000. And, and it works because in the United States, something very important for everybody to remember, and I, I forgot to say this, I can't believe I did. We are the only country on the planet that allows pharmaceutical companies unfettered power to set their own pricing. Nobody else does that. So if tomorrow Pfizer says, oh, that drug's $5, I'm gonna charge 5,000 for it, as Rising Pharmaceuticals did the other day, for those of you who saw with chloroquine, which is one of the uh, drugs that Trump had mentioned at a press conference might be useful as an anti-malarial in fighting COVID-19, they doubled the price. And then there was an outcry and they said, oh, well, that's just a coincidence. We were planning the price increase anyway. It just happened to be at the same time that came out. I have a little trouble believing that, but I'll give them the benefit of the doubt until I look into it more. My point is they can make the price whatever they want. In England and France and other countries, they negotiate the prices. And that's why the drug companies make their biggest profits here. So they are looking to squeeze the last dollar out. And it's a shame because we, the patients, end up paying the price. And even if you aren't taking one of these expensive drugs, you pay the price as a taxpayer because the law says that Medicaid patients and veterans have to be covered up for every drug that's approved essentially by the FDA. So if you get prescribed a very expensive drug, they should be. Veterans have put their life out for it. The uh, Medicaid patients have no coverage at all. But we, the taxpayer, are picking up these exorbitant prices that are being charged because no one's putting a check on the drug companies. Thank you. Um, I'll uh, follow up, I'll, I'll kind of build on what you're um, saying right there with this next question. Um, uh, Territorial asks, are we powerless over Big Pharma's lack of control? Um, as citizens, what are we able to do? Well, on, on a very simple, here's the simplest, it, like, okay, I want to come out, I want to get down to the very, very, like, uh, uh, part of it, 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 you know, easiest thing I can do. If you're taking a prescription drug, when you go into the pharmacy, be sure to ask the pharmacist, as crazy as this may sound, if you have insurance, by the way, if I pay cash price for this, is it less than my copay? 39 states still don't allow that to be said. It used to be 50. The pharmaceutical company and the pharmacy benefit managers had a gag rule in place that made it, it was against the rules for a pharmacist to tell you. So you give your insurance, you have a pill that you're taking for an antibiotic or that, and your copay is $20. If you happen to walk in and say, I have no insurance, I want to pay cash, it's $3. The pharmacist sees that on the system, but can't actually tell you you can save money. They're bound against doing that. So ask, and you might be surprised sometimes. That's the first way to save yourself some money. That gag rule, I think, is on its way out. The government should have gotten rid of it years ago. What you can also do is let your representatives, and I think this is key, 
Congress, people in Congress and, and people at the federal level, as well as the state level, but it's really the federal level that can regulate drugs because of the FDA and, and that. They respond to the issues that are hot button issues. If people want to talk about taxes, they're talking about taxes. If people want to talk about 9-11 uh, and the war in Iraq, that's what they're talking about. And today it's, it's COVID and they'll forget about pandemics in another year. And they will forget about drug prices. It'll be raised by somebody like me and how the industry gets away with everything unless we actually tell them when we want fixes. And I'll tell you, in this book, I have some easy fixes. I mean, easy for me to say, because I'm not in a position to implement them, but they could close the loopholes tomorrow on orphan drugs and bring it back to what was the real intent when Henry Waxman and the other Congress people stopped uh, passed this in the 1980s, and they'd eliminate the, these outrageous exorbitant prices of orphan drugs and the rehatching of these and the way they're recycled all the time. If they made the pharmacy benefit managers do one thing, expose or make transparent, not expose, just make transparent on a list that we the public could look at for the amount of rebate that they are getting on a drug, we would know how many times the pharmacy benefit managers are putting a drug on a formulary, not because it happens to be the best drug for the treatment of that condition, but because they're actually receiving on the $120 of the list price, $80 back from the pharmaceutical company in order to recommend it. It's not illegal, believe it or not. I mean, in most places you would think that sounds like bribery to me. No, it's legal. That's the way the system works, but we don't know when it happens because they aren't required to disclose it. You can't keep part of the drug pricing system in, in the dark and expect us to have any reform. Fabulous, thank you. Um, uh, Andrew asks, the Sackler family and others donate lots to universities. Do you think this perpetuates their model to medical students and bioengineers? Yeah, so it becomes uh, quite, uh, quite the controversy as I've watched it play out as I was finishing the book. And I would think about this often. And, you know, t at Tufts at University, at the medical school, and, uh, you know, they gave a lot of their money away, not only to arts at the Metropolitan Museum. I have even a chapter called the Temple of Dendur. It's in there. Mm -hmm. You can see how the Sacklers are so clever at negotiating, even when it comes to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, they have a secret uh, ground floor uh, sort of basement room that's given to them to store the art. Arthur Sackler does. It has its own telephone that rings only in that room. And it's not even on the map for the rest of the employees at the Met. And it's given to them as a freebie because he's negotiated a great deal before they get their name up on the Temple of Dendur. So they are fantastic uh, negotiators. I think that they did give away a lot of money. The, the heart, and when you read in this book, this chapters on opioids, you will see that they also encourage sort of what I call teachers and a faculty that were in a wave, a movement of reevaluating opioids. They didn't create this reevaluation. Uh, it was the perfect storm. In the 1980s, 10 years before OxyContin came out, a group of doctors who were in cancer care or palliative care had the idea that we had tarnished uh, the uh, idea of opioids for too long. They weren't really as addictive as we thought in the past, and we underdiagnosed pain. And they're talking about weaving in the medical community. So they said, we've got to diagnose pain more regularly. So they finally were able to succeed at making pain one of the five diagnostic signs that doctors are supposed to ask you when you go for a visit. So you go in and you're take, your blood pressure is taken, uh, you know, they'll see at what at that time, you're, if you have a fever, wait, and then, they ask you if you're in pain. They developed a scale of one to 10, or you know, one, six, five. So, and they said, doctors always look at pain as a symptom of some underlying disease. They never treat the pain. So they encouraged pain to be treated and they encouraged opioids to be dispensed more liberally. Now that's 1984, 85. Talk about how there's a stumble on this, how one letter in JAMA may have set off the revolution. By the time the Sacklers come around in 1996 with Oxycontin, and it becomes a blockbuster for them. They don't start to give the big money to schools like Tufts and Harvard and other until later. So you're really getting the money going in later to the medical programs. And they're relying on some of the medical research by these other doctors who are now working for them in the Speakers Bureau and as consultants and that. Some from the FDA have gone over to work for them to build curriculums that sort of fed into that line of uh, liberal opioid dispensing. So I understand why those schools have a special responsibility to say, hey, we're gonna look back and if we've been snookered here, we're gonna take the name off. The harder one to judge, by the way, as a sidelight is Arthur Sackler. He's, he's the patriarch, he's the zealot of his time. He's the, the genius who, the diabolical genius, if you wanna call it, who comes up with everything. His two brothers lived in his shadow a little bit. I, I often wonder if Arthur, if he had been alive, he died in, in 87 would have been as gung-ho as they had been on opium. But his um, 
his name is coming off of buildings as well. And I know that his family's tried to say, don't take it off, but the name Sackler itself is um, now sort of the, uh, in the target for all the death and destruction that took place across the country. More Americans have died from the opioid epidemic than died in the Civil War. That's a staggering statistic. Absolutely. Um, this next one is from Kristen. You mentioned that you think it's important for the pharma industry to be uh, for profit. Why is that? Well, it's a business. I mean, if the government wants to take over pharmaceutical manufacturing, they can do it. In the places in which they have done it uh, for a while in China, China's uh, pharmaceutical industry today, believe it or not, is much more vigorous than since they've let it go private than when it was under state control. Um, Cuba's pharmaceutical industry is non-existent. The state tried to run into the manufacturing. Italy tried to do that in the 30s. Uh, Germany had tried to do it for a while. And in Eastern Europe, it was the way until 1980 that most of the countries ran their own drug companies. And you don't know of one drug that came out of there. There was no innovation. Because I will say that the, the profit motive is an incentive, no question. Some of the scientists and researchers are working in the lab because they're also dedicated to really delivering on cures. That is without a doubt. But for the board executives, many of these are public companies. They have to perform. So they have to return for investors. And, and I don't mind that if we're keeping it that way. But I do object to being sort of the United States being the foolish one to say, OK, we know you're a for profit business and every other country in the world negotiates with you in some ways about their final prices. But you know what? We believe in capitalism so strongly. We think you can go and just charge us whatever you want. It's just foolish. They've been laughing at this in boardrooms for the last 50 years, and it's really time to just wake up. We're not saying you can't make money, or at least I'm not. I'm just saying, you know, make it a reasonable amount. And the incidents in the book of price gouging that you will see are the types of things you shake your head at because it, it, they could have made just they could have made a good return without having to go that extra degree. And this isn't something, by the way. You know, I talk about this with Trish often, we put it into the book, and that is, this isn't like somebody charging me an extra amount for tires for my car. They're charging me $300 instead of 150. It's not like I'm going to buy a toothbrush and it's $10 and it should have been a dollar. This is about our health. These are drugs you often need to be able to get through conditions that are really serious in almost all instances. And I think that to the extent that it deals with drugs, it is a quasi public trust. The government has the ability, by the way, never uses it really, it did in the 1960s once. It's called Title 28, Section 1498. Look that one up later on Google. 1498 is uh, where the government can come in and seize a patent, not just of drug companies, but of anybody. They don't really seize it, they can use it. It's like eminent domain for, um, for drugs. So if we had a situation in which somebody came up with the COVID-19 vaccine and said it's $1,000 a person, at least in America, they could use 1498 to say, we're taking that away. The drug company didn't think they were getting paid enough. They could go to court, but that's the process. It's just never used. I talk about those limitations in the book about how our hands are tied. We have to have our hands untied when it deals with pharmaceutical lobby. Mm -hmm. um, Clay asks, um, kind of related, uh, what's the story behind pharma being able to set their own prices in the USA while in other countries governments negotiate? Yeah, I, here's the interesting thing. So in other countries, they negotiate, and they often do it this way. I mean, NIH, uh, the National Institute, uh, the uh, NIH is the National Institute of Health here in America. The NHS, excuse me, uh, Tricia is British, and so I know the NHS well from our visits over there. The NHS, a government-run healthcare system, what they do with drug companies is the following. You come in as Pfizer or a new biotech, and you say, I have a treatment here for a diabetes. I have a new treatment for cystic fibrosis. How much is the drug? Novartis just had one at $2 million. Say what? They're the first one ever, by the way, the first drug company ever to offer insurance companies installment payments. It's fantastic. Like you say, it's like a layaway. Well, I go and buy that sofa. I can buy it for $1,200 and only pay $50 a month for the next uh, you know, 24 months. Now you can pay $500,000 in four installments if you're in the insurance company. So the $2 million, and this, and this is interesting because in this one chapter where I talk about the difference between other countries and us, they go to the NHS and they say, here's the price. The NHS does not say no. They say, now prove to us the money that we will save in treating that person for all the medical conditions, drugs, and everything else that they're taking that your drug's going to take them off of. So now it's a, it's a final cost analysis. You say, okay, this person has a life expectancy of another 34 years. They come in for dialysis so many times a week. They have problems sometimes with sugar peaking. They have to go to the hospital emergency care. If this drug does what it's supposed to, it removes all of this for them. 
They're charging 400,000, but we save 1.4 million on lifetime costs. Then the NHS comes back and says, okay, we understand that. And they push the company down even a little bit further because they understand that the 400,000, the first list price is sort of an ask price. Will you pay us that? And then when they get a little pushback, they lower it. You look at these drugs and there's, there's part of a chapter in here, which I have about gaming the system in which you'll see time and time again, the very same drug. I compare the price here and the price abroad. It's not a different drug. They still have a patent on it. They still have a monopoly, but they are using it in a way in which we pay two to four times the cost. So we in the United States, it's often been said, we subsidize the drug research of the rest of the world. Okay, that's fine. But what I'm aggravated with is not only that, I don't like subsidizing the entire world's drug research for paying high prices, but we also subsidize share buybacks. That's a lot of what pharma companies do in their public companies. We also share, uh, uh, share uh, and subsidize exorbitant and very high salaries often. Um, and we and speakers bureaus for doctors and, and gifts to doctors and swag, pharma swag. So, you know, the prices could be lower here. There's no question about it. Thank you. Um, uh, Stephanie asks, can you explain why there are so many toxic side effects in pharmaceutical drugs? What happened to the first do no harm belief? It seems absent from the philosophy guiding the development of um, all drugs. Um, when you look at drug commercials and they list the side effects, the side effects are often more harmful than the disease itself. Yeah, you know, so th this is, um, I, there was, by the way, no direct to consumer advertising, a, a, a chapter in this um, about little purple pills and Prozac and everything else. There was no direct to consumer advertising before 97. Some people like Sackler used to try to get around it. They would actually place an ad in the middle of Time Magazine um, and then would be sent to doctor's offices. And one point the FDA said, you're not supposed to advertise to consumers. And they said, oh no, we're advertising to doctors. It's sent to doctors. They could, it's a perforated ad. They could rip that ad out before they put it in their waiting room. Uh, you know, that was a, a cutting around the corner. But we now advertise directly to us. You turn on the TV, you hear about some wonderful drug, and then you listen to the list of side effects at the end. And you think, my God, who would take that? The only way the drug company doesn't have to tell you about the side effects, by the way, is if they don't tell you what it's for. So the interesting thing is Claritin did that once. They ran the ad and they, the ads for Claritin back in the uh, late 90s was a couple running through a field of flowers and it just looked wonderful. When I first saw it, I thought it was for an antidepressant or that it turns out it was for an allergy medication. OK, but it made you curious enough that you went on and then searched about it. But the, it's almost impossible to develop a drug that doesn't have a side effect for something else. And I mean that even in terms of penicillin. There are people allergic to penicillin where they were giving in vast numbers to present, uh, prevent blood infections in the battlefield. There would be some people who would go into shock because of penicillin. They didn't know until they got it. So even in a life-saving drug like that. With the polio vaccine, this is something in, you know, there's a chapter I have about polio vaccine. In the 1950s, they went with the soft vaccine, which is a uh, dead virus, sort of what they give in the influenza virus at the end of the year. So it's not supposed to cause any illnesses. One of the companies chosen by the government to make the, the, that particular vaccine, Cutter, put some live virus in by mistake. Uh, many people may not remember this. In 10 states, 40,000 children got sick, 200 ended up as permanent cripples, 10 died. So the government put a halt to the soft vaccine. And that shows you how something can happen when you don't expect it at all because it's not manufactured right. And they went to the Sabin vaccine, which is a competing one. That's a live virus, okay? Now that meant, that was the virus given to me as a child when I was at grammar school and it was dipped into a little sugar cube and given to you as oral. The, I didn't realize this, so I did the book, it was shocking. Doctors knew that out of every million people, there would be a few cases of polio. It was inevitable that some people would be so susceptible to developing polio that they would get it from the live vaccine. And you know where they did, you talk about, you say, why are they allowed to market things with side effects? You know where they did the experiments, the clinical stage one, stage two, and stage three, when it didn't exist as a rule, they had to do it. They didn't have to prove it then. They went to the Belgian Congo and they tested on a million people in the Belgian Congo in 1959. An author, many years later, came up with a theory that that's how AIDS came out through those early vaccines because they used the livers of monkeys. Um, they now have proven that it's a completely different strain of AIDS. But I will tell you the idea of testing on a million people in the Belgian Congo in the 1950s on a live vaccine uh, uh, for polio, not the greatest way to develop a vaccine even for an epidemic. Absolutely not. Um, and can I say one other thing on vaccines since we're talking yeah. about COVID and vaccines? Sometimes um, 
somebody will ask me, they say, okay, Kai, you have this dark view of pharma. And I, I have a good view of pharma too. It's, it is the yin and the yang, like any industry. But why do you think they would take advantage of this vaccine they develop? And I say, let's look at the most recent example. By the way, it's been 43 years. We don't have a, uh, we have a vaccine on Ebola as of last year. It took 43 years to develop. Uh, a lot of money had been spent on that. We still don't have a vaccine for AIDS, but we do have a treatment for AIDS. The, we have a number of treatments now with PrEP and other drugs that may help. But the first drug, AZT, which came out in the 1980s, here's the example to watch out for. It was a researcher at NIH, our taxpayer funded National Institutes of Health, who first thought they were looking at the possibility of antivirals working against this virus, new virus, HIV, just like uh, you have here with coronavirus. This was a totally new virus. He said, I think that this drug compound that Burroughs has could be useful. We should test it. So the government went to Burroughs and they said, by the way, we know you have a patent on this drug, but you're not using it. The drug had proven so toxic when they tried to use it before, they weren't using it. So can we have some for our testing? Burroughs said, fine. Burroughs could not make the drug in their own lab because it had been so long since they made it. The NIH had to step in and give them the DNA strand that was necessary for them to actually make the compound. Burroughs then sent the compound to the NIH, who does a year of testing at taxpayer expense. They test it all the way through. They get private research and academic researchers to help with them. The end result is the first drug to treat AIDS, ACT. What does Burroughs do? It then takes it, puts a patent on it, which the US government fought and said, no, don't make it a general patent. They lost in court, the federal government did. Burroughs priced the drug at $10,000 a patient, which at that time was the most expensive drug on the planet. AIDS activists act up, protested that, so they dropped the price to $8,000. They made several billion dollars in the first three years. So if you said to me before that happened, oh, by the way, you know what's going to take place? We're going to get a new virus that's going to kill a lot of people. And when it does kill those people, the government's going to come up with a fix using a drug compound from one company. And that company is going to be able to get an exclusive patent on it and sell it at a record price. I'd say, you're crazy. It's not going to happen. But it did happen. So when people today say, oh, by the way, there's too much uh, transparency on them. We're all in this uh, pickle together. They will never be able to charge a lot of money. You know, they haven't been in business making uh, half a trillion dollars a year as the gross sales of the top 10 companies uh, without being very clever. Thank you, absolutely. Um, so we've got four more questions left. Can we do them kind of rapid fire? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, great. Um, uh, Andrew, another Andrew asks, um, forgive me a question about a previous work. Your book Case Closed about the Kennedy assassination um, was the lifeline of sanity during the um, Oliver Stone induced panic of the early 1990s. Do you think the conspiracy mongering mindset of America is unique and how does it make us susceptible to manipulation by pharma companies? I guess that's yeah, I, I don't think the conspiracy mindset is unique to America. It's certainly uh, worldwide and uh, you can see that on coronavirus, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, there are already theories that it's a Chinese lab, a biological lab that produced it. In Iran, they're saying you see the United States or Israel that produced it. Uh, you know, so uh, as some people think pharma produced it so they could come up with a fix. So I'm not surprised to see those. Uh, the, uh, there is, by the way, I think that just continues, but I know I'm keeping them short. So let's hit the other three. And then I want to mention one thing after the third one. Okay, absolutely. Um, so uh, with regards to opioids, have the descendants of the Sackler brothers been called to account? And do you think they will be? I certainly hope they will be held to account. They've been sued private. Uh, they've been named as defendants, the Sackler family members who were board directors of Purdue by a number of state's attorney generals. They've had a bankruptcy court now stay those proceedings. And we will find out in April whether we can proceed against them. We mean all the attorney generals for suits. And um, I, they're still going to be left with billions of dollars, but they will pay some price, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and then finally, um, can you talk about the consequences of diminishing pharmaceutical investment in infectious disease treatment and vaccines and how um, that has contributed to the current pandemic? Yeah, so the interesting thing, since it's a viral pandemic, it hasn't contributed to it because even if they were spending $100 billion a year, even if they were all involved in vaccine research, they'd have to start from scratch on this since it's a new virus. They'd have to still figure out its genetic line, its makeup. They've done that very quickly. They'd have to get the test for it. Then they have to test it through these clinical trials that take at least a year. So we would not speed up the process at all in that. And that's an odd part of it. It's only on the sort of the uh, antibiotics that that's an issue. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Um, I want to say one thing, if I can. 
there's one very uplifting story in the book. It's this chapter called You Messed With the Wrong Mom. I encourage everybody to read that or look at Wired, which has an excerpt for it, but it's better in the book because it ties into the chapters around it. It is a story of one woman, Marianne Skolik Perez, whose daughter died of OxyContin. And instead of just you know being sad about it, she was sad, but she chased Purdue and she was behind them at every step. She got the FDA involved. She is a one woman army against Purdue Pharma, has been for years. The first time her story is told is here in this book. And I think it's a remarkable story. That's an uplifting one in the book. That is awesome, yeah. I definitely will be will be looking at that in your book soon um i have a final question um i know that you um you and uh trisha are uh distancing yourselves um and isolating as you should be um are you reading anything um to get you through these times so so we are so we're odd because you think we should be reading a novel or some wonderful bit of fantasy or something else um uh, but we're actually reading The Only Plane in the Sky, an oral history of 9-11, uh, Garrett Garth's book, and we're enjoying it. We lived 9-11, we were in New York at the time. I wrote a book about it, Why, Why America Slept. I wrote a book about the Saudis, so here I am in my spare time and her spare time, we're talking about, oh, you remember that? So that's what we're reading. Hey, you know, different strokes for different folks. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much, Gerald, um, for this really very, very apropos conversation. Um, and thank you to everybody for listening at home. Um, another reminder that you can buy um, Gerald's book, Pharma, at the green button below. Um, it'll remain active um, after this event if you uh, come back to his page to, to see the talk, um, the, the playback of the talk. Um, Thank you all so much for being with us tonight. Um, again, your purchases are what is keeping our store open and our events streaming. Um, truly, they're everything that's keeping us going right now. Um, you can follow Politics and Prose on Crowdcast for future events um, at the button with our logo on it near the top of your screen. Um, Tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., we're hosting Best Cobbs, Nobody Will Tell You This But Me. Um, and looking ahead to this weekend, Saturday at 5 p.m., we have Professor Christopher Bonner's debut, Remaking the Republic. Um, again, Gerald, thank you so much. Um, and until next time, stay well read, everybody. You say, and everybody uh, there as well, stay safe. And I hope to see you on the other side of the pandemic. All right.